how does it, this reality of aging and death affect all of us in ways we don't even understand? Welcome, welcome, welcome to Spiritually Hungry Live in New York. It's Saturday night. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who remembers the story, Harold and the Purple Crayon by Crockett Johnson? There's one person. A few people. Raise your hands. There you go. A few people. Wow. I've never heard about it. Not a very popular book. I'm sure. I just want to share something. You didn't read it. No, I didn't read it. Are you going to share it? I'm going to share 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 something completely different. I know what you're going to do. So Monica and I recorded this episode about (laughs) six weeks ago. No, beginning of summer. Beginning of summer, sorry. And we were really excited about it because we really, you know, sometimes when you do something, you really feel it went really well and, and the content was great. And then a few seconds after we finished recording it, the person who was in charge of saving it and sending it to where it needed to be sent erased the episode. So, so here we are again. <laughs> so here we are again, and this time I think it will be even better because of all of your energy here with us. But actually, I thought it was perfect because what we're going to discuss is actually very much aligned with the new year. So it was all meant to be. And if I can add one more thing before you start. And you will. <laughs> so when we first started recording the podcast uh, in the, during COVID, so around 2000, 2000 2001. 20? Yeah. <laughs> 2021 or 2020. Um, we, so at that time, it was just Monica and I, and you know, it was COVID, so nobody really was around. So we had one microphone and we were recording. And we also did an episode on, on, uh, on evil speech. And after finishing, and that I, was, and really I, that was completely take. my responsibility at the time. After finishing to record that episode, I completely lost it. So there's two episodes that we've done that must have a lot of light and energy in them that we recorded them completely lost them. But I think really when you live a life that is based on the spiritual principles, you really enjoy, first you accept and then you enjoy all the things that go that's not as exactly as you'd want them. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing, but on the, on the way over here this morning, he doesn't have a choice. He doesn't have a choice. <laughs> no, you're so I was about. with David, our, our oldest son, David, but also with Josh. But David had a cup of coffee. And David, has, David does not like, you know, I have, I have a list of things for each one of my kids that, you know, if it was me, I'd do different. So for David, it would be, I'd always put a, I always put a lid whenever I'm having tea or coffee. I think it's safer, right? Would you oh, not agree with me? by the way, it? before you left the house this morning, I said, David, <laughs> would you like to put a lid on your coffee? <laughs> no, so, I'm good. Yes. Remember that? So, so by the way, this is a little bit off topic. So every, so when David's in town, we go to Mignon in the morning together. We drive together, and so David never puts the lid on his coffee. And we're in the car together. And I'm always like looking at the cup, you know, as it's sloshing back and forth. Is it gonna, is it gonna spill all over the, the front console of the car? But anyway, on the ride over here, the, the you know, we were on a rickshaw, and you know, of course, it's bumpy. And David didn't have a lid on his coffee, and it spilled all over his pants. No, it's built on Josh's also. Josh also, yes. <laughs> so, so the first, there's a song, there's a song. So I saw David was not necessarily very happy in the moment. So <laughs> there's a song that, that I really like. And so I just started singing it to David. And the song goes, everything is from the creator and therefore it must be for the best. Sing it for us. What? You have to sing it I can it sing it. it. I can sing yeah, it. Yeah, you got to sing Yes? It. Okay. So if you, if you know it... By the way, it, the podcast is not about any of this at <laughs> yes, all. Yes, okay? It's completely off topic. So, uh, um, so the, song, okay, the song goes, the words are, if you know it, please join. Hakol mi'ito yitbarach, and ubevadai hakol letova. Everything is from the Creator, and therefore it must be for the good. So if you know, if you know the song... It's such a good song, sing yes. it, yeah. Ha, hakol mi'ito yitbarach. Bevadai akol letova, akol meito, akol meito, akol meito itbarach, akol meito itbarach. Bevadai akol letova, akol meito, akol meito, akol meito itbarach. Bevadai akol letova. So that's, so that's my tangent, but I think it is an important lesson. Sorry, Monica, you were saying. No, yeah, let's lean into it all. So I was talking about Harold. He doesn't seem very interesting at this point, but Harold had a purple crayon. And 
what I, I actually didn't like this book either when I was a child because there, we open it and there's, there are no drawings on the first two or three pages. Now as an adult, when I started reading to my kids, and really I only started to like it when I found it for Abigail, was that Harold takes a purple crayon and he draws his reality. So if he's going to go on a trip, he finds a beach and then he sees the ocean, he wants to go on the ocean, so he draws himself a, a boat, he gets on the boat, and then he needs something else, so he keeps drawing his reality. So it's really quite an inspiring book uh, once you get past the desire to see beauty right away. It's like you have to create it and imagine it. So he knew wisely that he needed to have boundaries and landmarks and guideposts. And if he was hungry, he scribbled up a purple pie. He just went on and on with his day. So, Mikhail, I'll ask you, if you had to scribble something up, what would it be? Scribble something up. I think this. I'd <laughs> scribble this. This is perfect. That's <laughs> true. There's nothing I would add or take away. That's the truth. Mm. <laughs> okay, that was your spiritual answer. What's your other answer? They're not always aligned, but I have to say in this moment... Like a pillow? Much a pillow? No, no, no. no. Um, this, is, this is all perfect. This is all perfect. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so... What I like about this story is that we, it reminds me that we also have the power to create our own stories. And yes, our stories are probably going to be more complex and we'll need many, many crayons. But the truth of the matter is we can create any story we want on any given day. And it's kind of actually, now I realize what you shared about David this morning, it's exactly that, right? You can live in a different reality, you can get upset about spilled coffee or anything else, but... You know, if you think, like, I'm going to maybe use an eraser and also color in what I really want to see. And we were inspired by this idea, really, about, I think, overall, it's about aging and death. But we had read an article in the New York Times. Originally, it was last week, but now it was beginning of summer. It was an interesting article about what happens to fruit flies who witness death. So we were intrigued. Neurobiologist Christy... Gendron and biologist Scott Pletcher, scientists at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, conducted a study in which they enclosed living flies in vials with dead flies for two days. I'm happy I'm not a fruit fly. Christy Gendron starts his story with this quote, there's a very special place in fly hell for me. So he found that fruit flies that had seen corpses were avoided by other flies as if they had been marked by death. The carcass viewers also quickly lost stored fat and died sooner than their non-traumatized counterparts. Now, this is intriguing because we're talking about fruit flies, right? So if that's how they react to experiencing or being in close quarters with a dead corpse, how does it, this reality of aging and death affect all of us in ways we don't even understand? Yeah, I was going to add that one of the interesting parts, not so much to the point, but interesting parts in that article is that, I, and I wasn't fully aware of this, that animals, many, many animals have a whole ritual around, around death and grieving. So for instance, um, elephants actually have a time of mourning, the way they grieve for their dead. Crows actually hold funerals. And bees, ants, and termites, for them there are specialized people within their community who undertake the, the, the process of undertaking, of you know, the, the burial of these uh, of the, the dead animals. So it's not just obviously within the human experience that you have these processes, but obviously there's a lot that we can learn, especially from this study, about how we can actually transform our own lives. For sure. And I think, for me, what I thought about when I read that is that really our thoughts can make us age faster. So if we don't have a healthy relationship or with the idea of aging, we'll go to many costs to avoid it, or even death. We won't even think about it, we'll fear it, but death and aging are part of living. And for me, I think the power of this article or this idea is to really be able to reframe the things that scare us the most and learn, find, explore, you know, why are these things part of our reality? Why do they exist? And what is there for us to come to so we have a healthy relationship with it? Besides the obvious, right? If you fear something, instead of trying to avoid it, see where there is something you can learn from it, right? What is the opportunity? Absolutely. And again, one of the things which is very interesting is that they point out that when 
there were these fruit flies that ex that saw death, and there was the, obviously the, re the rest of them, the, cohort, the other cohorts that did not see the dead flies. They, the other flies that did not experience, did not see death, actually avoided the first group of flies. So there actually was an entire, and again, it's not clear scientifically why, but there clearly is an energy that rests upon somebody who's seen death, and more importantly, who's scared of death. And not only does it, did it cause their death, those flies that saw it come earlier, but it also created an environment. The rest of the flies didn't want to be around them. And really, this is a very basic spiritual concept, but one which I think is probably the most difficult one for any one of us to truly take in, to truly live, to truly transform towards, which is that 99% of our life experience is based on our consciousness. This is not a new concept to anybody who's been studying Kabbalah, certainly not a new concept to us, but I can guarantee that almost every single person in this room fails in this understanding. Because the entire purpose of our spiritual work is to elevate our consciousness. And if you do that, and you do that consistently and properly, then you should be experiencing a completely different life than you would otherwise. Any time, and again, again, it's interesting, I was having this conversation earlier today with David as well, is that in life, there's 99% of things, 99% of things that should not upset us, that do. There's probably 1% that are truly important, that are truly worth, worth our attention and sometimes concern. But 99% of the things that we are upset about, that we are disappointed about, those should not be, should not be. So, one of the most important ways to gauge our spiritual development needs to be, is my experience of life right now, because of my changed consciousness, that much drastic, it needs to be drastic, drastically a better experience than it, would, than it would have been otherwise. Meaning, I can see that today, something that would have upset me yesterday no longer upsets me. Something that would disappoint me today no longer disappoints me. That is, I think, one of the clearest ways to gauge one's spiritual development, but it's something, again, as I said, it's not a new concept, but when you understand that it influences everything, it influences not just our experience, but also, as this study shows, it influences our health. That, again, so what happens here? You have, you have these fruit flies that saw death, and obviously, in some way, that was a negative experience for them, and every second from then on, they carried that negative experience, and it made them die earlier. So it's not just a spiritual concept, some ethereal concept. It's actually one of the most important changes that we must do in our lives. We must, we must find the way through our study and practice to experience almost nothing as negative. Like Monica spoke earlier today, but again, you can talk about it, but the question is in, as the rabbi, my father would often say, the proof is in the pudding, you know, what is your experience of life? Ask yourself that question. If you're truly on a spiritual path, and you're really using those tools, then it must be, it must be, that your experience, that your health, that every part of your life, you actually see marked differences. Marked differences. Otherwise, you know, it's, it remains a concept in the head that has no influence on the rest of your life, and, you know, a person can go the way of the fruit fly. Well, science explains what's happening, right? There's something called telomeres. Are you familiar with that? So... It's the repeating segments of non-coding DNA that exists at the end of chromosomes. And they do many different things, important things, to make sure our genetic material doesn't unravel. And most importantly, they're shorter with each cell division, determining how fast our cells age. So when they become too short, they stop dividing altogether. And they are not responsible for our overall aging process, but they're a huge contributor to getting old. So what they found is that they're listening to us. And what does that mean? They listen to our thoughts. They listen to what we say to ourselves, what we fear, and then they respond to that. So when you're stressed, when you're self-deprecating, your telomeres actually, the, the, they get shorter and people age faster. So if you need any impetus to actually do the spiritual work, that's it because your body is changing. It's listening to your thoughts. And we all have stories, right? We have the story of a villain, the hero, the lover, the hater, so what is your story? And how you 
tell the story day in and day out affects your body, affects how quickly you age. And so we can try to avoid it and we can do all the 1% things to make us look better and feel better. But if this very fundamental thing isn't being done, then really all of that is a Band-Aid. You'll look good, but then things catch up. And, you know, I, I remember a story that I told myself for a long time, which is a story that somebody else told me and I believed, was that I should not ever teach or speak in public because nobody would listen. And I really believed that for a very long time until it was so overwhelming. I thought, well, why is it that nobody wants me to say anything? <laughs> I'm actually going to do it. But if I had listened to that, right, if I, that was the story, then who I became many years later would not be a happy person, right? I would age differently. I would see life differently. So it's a really important thing. It's not just about seeing death or witnessing death. It's what are the stories in your head and what do you believe to be true? Because whatever you see day in and day out, whatever story you tell yourself and you believe affects your body, of course, because body and mind speak to each other even when you are not aware of it. That's a very important point. And like you said, it's not just what other people tell us and we believe, unfortunately, the negative things, but it's also the, the story that we tell ourselves, even good stories. How many of us actually believe, and I would, again, I don't ask for a raise of hands, but actually believe that the framework of my life, even the good things, this is the boundaries within which they exist. So again, we've spoken about this over the past day, day and a half, but that my view of life getting better is this box with a little bit more. As opposed to the understanding, and this is something that is very difficult to do, but to say that nothing of my life should ever be limited. That it's not about necessarily incremental betterments in different areas of my life. We've told and we've bought into the story of who I am. And again, the good is also a problem. Of course, the bad stories that we've taken and said about ourselves and believed is a problem, but even the good stories that we tell about ourselves. You know, there's a story I repeat all the time, and maybe it's worth repeating again, about a great Kabbalist who wrote many books and had thousands of students. And every time he would publish a new book, he would have a celebration. And when, in one of these celebrations, he tells the following story. And he shares that when he was a child, he was not very good at school. He didn't enjoy it. He didn't want to go. One night, he's in his room, and his parents are in the next room. And he hears them really in pain, crying to each other, what are we going to do with our son? He doesn't want to study. He doesn't want to go to school. They're, they're going to kick him out of school. What's going to be of him? And he says, when I heard the pain in my parents' voice, I decided that I'm going to now completely change myself. I'm going to enjoy school, I'm going to go to school, then I'm going to learn, I'm going to excel. Completely turned around, 180 degrees. And of course, over time, over the number of years, I learned and I learned and I became a scholar and I became a teacher and I became an author. And now I have thousands of students and I've written so many books that so many people, thousands can study from. He says, I'm not telling you the story to self-aggrandize myself, but I want to share with you the other way my life could have gone. Imagine I, had I not heard my parents that night. By nature, I'm a good person, he says. So I would have been relatively illiterate, not finished school, but I would have been a good person. I'd find some way to make a living. And, you know, if I could, I'd help people out. I'd give a little bit of charity here and there. I'd be a spiritual person because by nature, I'm a good person. I would live my entire life as a very good, simple person. And then when my soul would have left the body eventually, I'd come up to the heavens and they would ask me and they would say, where are your thousands of students? And I'd look at the creator, dumbfounded, me, thousands of students, I could hardly read. They were, I couldn't teach one more person. You know, you ask, what are you asking me about thousands of students? But they'd ask. And then they would ask and say, where are your, all of the books that you were supposed to write? And again, I'd be shocked. Me, write a book, I could hardly read half a page. You expected me to have written so many books? He said, of course, because that other path would have been a good path. I would have been a good person, a spiritual person, a sharing person, but the light of my soul 
in its complete form would never have been revealed. And therefore, I want to really, we've spoken about what the negative stories that we tell ourselves, their influence on our lives, and they're very detrimental. But even the positive stories that we tell about ourselves can also be detrimental. Whenever we see our potential as limited, even in a good way, that's a problem. One of the most important, again, and it's not, it's sometimes it's easy maybe to hear, it's easy to share, but to really break free, to really break free of our limitations, certainly for the bad, but even for the good. To really think that, and all, all of us, we're all spiritual people, we've all done good things, beautiful. But that that's not even close, not even close to what my soul is meant to do in this world. Only when we're consistently thinking like that can the potential of who we are actually meant to be, who we are actually meant to be, can become who we are. And I often think about you know, the greatest spiritual giants. We talk, if you talk about Moses, you talk about Rabbi Akiva, all, many of the great Kabbalists and spiritual teachers, Moses, when he was 120 years old, was ready for something brand new. It happened to me that he had done everything he needed to do, but in his mind, it wasn't, let me do some more of what I've done for the first 120 years of my life, but rather, what's the next crazy expansion that my soul can go through? And only, only if we're really thinking in this way, do we have the ability, the ability to actually express ourselves in this world in the ways that we're meant to? I love that you went all the way to uh, the other side and the positive. I want to rewind just a little bit about how we, the three states of mind that cause the most harm to our magical telomeres. Because I think that that's very lofty. And of course, I, I, I agree a thousand percent. I think that often... I'm going to talk about this tomorrow actually more, but we get stuck in a state that's even positive and we think that's everything. We don't move from that, which is so dangerous because you actually think that you are changing, growing, and doing good. But back on topic, we're going to talk about the three states of mind that we all find ourselves in. One is cynical hostility, which is defined as high anger and frequent thoughts that others can't be trusted. This type of hostility isn't just a general annoyance like sitting in traffic. It's a rageful thought that the person who cut you off is stealing your time and actively disrespecting you in the process. I know nobody wants to admit that. We all have been there, okay? Cynical hostility. Um, it's funny. I wrote this on my notes back at the beginning of summer. We, you made a joke that I would write the next book would be called Stress is Not an Option. <laughs> because... Um, it changes all kinds of things in our bodies when we're in that state. Then the next one is ruminating, which is replaying an interaction over and over in your mind, comparing it to a list of other similar interactions, drawing conclusions about yourself as a person, and steeping in the negativity. So research from the University of Michigan says that when you ruminate, the stress and anxiety caused by those thoughts stick around in the body long after the thoughts are gone. That is scary. And the third is pessimistic attitude. While the studies around the thought pattern is still new, the current findings show people who scored high on pessimism inventories had shorter telomeres. This also fits with existing research that says consistent pessimism adversely affects the healing of those who are battling life-threatening or old age-related diseases. So I think that's pretty powerful information for changing our thoughts. For sure. Right, so if we're talking about the negative, I mean, again, by this most of... I think many of us know the science is so clear on this, right? That people who are unhappy, their immune system is lower. It takes them longer to recover from, from illness and disease. I mean, you know, it's, I often like that, you know, many of us, of course, are spiritual and open to spirituality. But science is telling us so much of the same, which is it's just not worth it to be once, if you can, and we can control it. 99% of the time, you can control it. Unhappiness, stress, disappointment, we can control it almost all the time. I think we don't fear it enough, you know, so I was, maybe, maybe we should fear, stre meaning stress that we cause ourselves, we should fear sadness that we allow to the degree that we can allow it to remain with us. The, as Monica said, the damage that it does to our physical body, the damage that it does to our soul is li literally incalculable. So we're going to take some questions. I hope you guys are really brave and bold. All of this can be changed. I think we need to really challenge ourselves to how we feel about 
our lives, our stress, being joyful in every moment, how we feel about process, aging really is a big one, and death. And I, you know, I, I like to read a lot. Um, I saw this article, and I like Harrison Ford. I think he's really kind of interesting. And the interview, the guy asked him kind of questions I didn't think were, were so great. But he said, what was it like seeing yourself made younger through technology? I guess this is Indiana Jones. And he said, I was really gratified that when it comes my turn to be de-aged, the technology's right. It's not Photoshop thing. It's literally my face from 35 years ago. And then they said, did you find yourself wanting to be that young again? He says, oh, F no. <laughs> Why not? I don't want to be young again. I was young, and now I enjoy being old. What's enjoyable about being old? He said, you're certainly physically diminished by age, but there are wonderful things about age, richness of experience, the full weight of all the time you've been spending getting to be old, and there's a certain ease in it for me. And I just thought that simplicity, that approach to life and all the things that come with a rich life, I mean, accept all of it, enjoy all of it, get rid of the baggage, the negative thoughts, because you're already old then. <laughs> That's the thing. We're worried about getting there. but being in that state, I mean, that is, that's old, and that's tired, and that's boring. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we have the opportunity now for, for a few questions. Uh, maybe come up to David, David Ziaz or Dan yeah, Remember last, last year we had some amazing questions. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a very high bar, but I do. remember his name? What was his name? I forgot, I forgot it. You remember him? Uh, I only remember he was saying, he called him Mike. Yeah. I, think, I think his name was Stan. Stan the man? Stan the man. Stan, Stan here? Dan, Dan uh, the man. Oh, we miss him. Well, that's the impact he made. We all remembered his name. <laughs> well, you know, oh. I, I want to ask a question okay. first. As you know, I'm going to do that. Put David in front of the I mic. I want to set the tone. And then... <laughs> I want to set the tone. And, I, and, I, and obviously, I want to ask a thoughtful question that I think is, is for all of us. Um, you shared this powerful story about the Kabbalist who, when he was young, he overheard his parents crying. And so that changed his life path. It's funny, because as soon as I heard that, I thought of myself, you know, at the age of 20, making a decision to come on this path full time, to join Kabbalah Center full time, which the best decision I ever made in my life. But also, I could hear my parents crying in the other room, <laughs> saying, you know, what will be of our son? And he's throwing his life away and all that. And I can imagine if I had listened to them, kind of like where I'd be. Obviously, they're very, ha I think they're very happy and proud today, but back, back you then... You're not sure? I, I, I not don't want to sure. put words in Let's their mouth. Let's ask your brother. Let's ask your brother you if know, you know. With Persian parents, you just don't know. <laughs> so, so that's like, that question kind of segues into, we actually did give, uh, we did give a seminar for just Persians in, in LA. It was like 400 Persians. And the main, we asked everybody, like, what's the main fear? And everyone said the main thing that's ruling over their life is what everyone in the community is thinking about them their parents, their siblings, the other, they call it the other people. And I hear then many cultures are like this. And in our Kabbalah community, it's like this. What is my teacher going to think? When is it right to listen? When is it right? How do you, what's your compass? Like even personally, what's your compass to make a decision? Because I know even for the both of you, especially you've told me, Michael, like on one hand, you could care less what anybody thinks. But the other hand, I know you actually are very thoughtful and you care. So what is the guidance you can give for all of us? Because we're so pulled in by our society and our parents and our teachers. Like, when, how do you make your own decisions? Well, Yay, it's... David. <laughs> we're proud of you, David. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. <laughs> well, your question speaks to me on many levels. I'm Persian, and I understand the culture very well. Uh, first, I would say run as fast as you can. <laughs> as fast. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, seriously, I uh, and I started studying Kabbalah when I was 17, and my parents brought me, my my grandmother actually, and and then my family all followed, and and of course, you know, compared to where I was in life on a on a path they thought was dangerous and. Um, that I was headed in the wrong way, the Kabbalah was the answer. And then when I got very involved, now you're too involved and you don't know, uh, you can't tell, you know, you're too young to know what's good for you. And then I went all in. And then we started dating and I didn't tell them 
because that was really all in, in ways that they <laughs> hadn't even thought of. And I remember in that process, I really got to a place of hearing my voice and knowing what felt real to me. And at the same time, I was going through that whole eating disorder. So it was a very, it was a time of like, all of that was, what do, what do they think? Like, that was the world I lived in. What do they think? What do they want? How can I please? How can I help? What will make people happy? What do I look like to the outside? To the point where I was killing myself. And then I started to change and hear a different voice, which was, what do I believe? What do I desire? But from a really true place, from a, a soul place. So the more involved I got, I understood that that was feeding that side of me. And then when we fell in love, I also knew that I needed to protect that because I didn't want any outside noise or influence until we were in a place where it was very clear what it was going to be. So we dated for nine months and, you know, many questions from my, my mother mostly. My father was kind of on board. But I just came home one day and said, because uh, they asked me like weeks before, you know, I know you're dating Rabbi Berg's son. And I was <laughs> like, no, no, I'm not. And then I came home a few weeks later, and I said, I'm getting married, actually. <laughs> so it's never going to be easy. It was not easy. My mom really went ballistic. She loves Mikhail. She loves our path now. But it was her own process, right? And I think that's the point. I think we allow so many people to influence us, and their influence is based on either their doubt or their fear or that they just don't see what you see. So everybody has to go through a process of really knowing themselves, deeply knowing who they are, so that they can make the right choices for themselves. And it's never going to be something that's automatic. It's something that you decide each and every day. And then when you make those decisions, you start to feel like a feeling settled inside, feeling settled internally. And you're like, okay, I can trust myself to make good choices. And then you make another choice. And let's say you made a mistake. And then you say, okay, well, that wasn't great, but it's a conversation you have with yourself because at the end of the day, your soul knows exactly what you need. Nobody else can tell you. Nobody can see your soul. Nobody can feel what you're feeling. You are the only person that fully knows what you feel or experience. So when you go outside and you ask every single person, A, you confuse yourself, and B, you shut down that internal voice that actually can tell you your truth. So, and, it, and when you deny that, right, when you ignore that, it gets harder and harder as you get older because you're so used to that external approval, validation, what do they think? The first thing I would say, when you are open to other people's opinions, just pause without judgment, completely without judgment, and ask yourself, this person that I'm allowing to influence me so much, so deeply, do I want to live like they are living? Would I make the choices they are making? Would I see them as a role model? Again, no judgment. You can love them, but do you want to mirror them? And usually, 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is no. So love them, hear them, okay? So the other part is, yes, be open to hearing anything because we are blind at the same time. Even though we know our soul knows and can guide us, we also, when we want to be blind and we want to lie to ourselves, we can. So hear the information, take it, and then sit with it, with yourself, and say, okay, how do I feel about this? If this person said something, why is it bothering me? Is it based on truth or is it based on a lie? If there's some truth, let me unpack that, let me explore that, let me evolve in it. If it's a lie, then you just say, I love you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll consider what you're saying. So I think that our beliefs are at, at stake, really, when we don't know what they are. The whole question that David asked, you will never not know what to do if you know who you are. If you know yourself, if you love yourself, it is a process. But once you start doing it, it becomes so immediate and automatic. It's like there's no separation between, really, what you're asking is, it, there's no separation between body and heart they're intertwined. You're completely in sync. And it's a very powerful place to be and everybody can get there. But that outside noise, especially in the Persian community, I mean, I think that's the thing that bothered me most of all growing up in that, you know, oh, do you know what they said? I was like, I don't care. And I think and I actually am grateful for it now because it really helped me get to a place where I'm liberated from it. But it was just crazy to me. I mean, it really never made sense. It's very much a movement. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I, only thing I would add is that, you know, as, as anything in life, there's never an, an absolute, right? You always have to gauge which, which side you're on. Maimonides would say that the, the middle path is always the best one, and, but if you're on one extreme, you have to go to the other extreme to be able to find the middle again. So I think most people 
are on the extreme side of actually caring, not in the right way about how people view them, what they think about them, what they say about them. And the work for that person would be to go to the other side, which is to get over and over time to a place where they literally don't care what other people are thinking about them, and then hopefully find the middle. Once you find yourself, for example, on the other extreme, where you really, and again, and this is something that I work on because I'm kind of on that side where literally I don't really care what, what anybody thinks. Where you have, well, you have to be, like Monica said, we are often blind. You do have to have people that you do, act, do listen to, and more importantly, be open to the fact that even if what they're saying is wrong, there might be a, some kernel of truth in there that you need to hear. It doesn't mean that what they're telling you to do is necessarily right, but there's something in there. Sometimes there isn't, but sometimes there is. And I think it's that battle of finding the middle ground, of not caring what people think as it relates to my ego, but being open to others as it relates to what I do need to change. And there's no black or white, it's not one extreme or the other, but I do think that most people in the world are too far to the side of caring, and therefore the work for most people will be to go to the other side of not caring. Those who find themselves on the side of not caring have to be careful to come to the middle where they actually do listen. So I think there's a very big difference between deciding based on what people are thinking and hearing them. So I think it's always important to hear. Sometimes there'll be nothing in it, some there'll be 10%, some there'll be 50%, and so on and so forth. But always, like Monica said, you have to be listening to your soul. You have to be listening to your soul and not caring and what your ego is going to experience, what your ego wants, and then, but still, still, to be open, because everything at the end is coming from the light of the Creator. So if somebody's saying something, it doesn't mean that what they're saying is right, but it's something that for whatever reason you need to hear, for whatever reason you need to hear, and you have to take the time to hear it. Yeah, I would just add, because if not, if it's, oh, I don't care, it can't come from the place of ego, like, I don't care what anybody says, you actually do need to hear but you decide if you internalize it. And the other thing I thought of as we were speaking is that you know, all those people that have a strong opinion, let's say you're dating somebody and now your family comes, oh, she's not good or he's not good, I don't like their family, or we heard this rumor, whatever else it is, and they're all there at the beginning. And then let's say you decide not to be with that person and then you're heartbroken, you're by yourself, are they there picking up the pieces? Well, let's say you do decide to marry them and you listen to them and it wasn't the person you wanted to be with, are they there when you're miserable? Like, at the end of the day, you are going to be with you and your body and your spirit and your mind. None of those other people that are giving you their strong opinions any which way, yes, they will love you, but it's your responsibility to love yourself enough to be able to guide and direct yourself in the ways that are the best for you. Thank you. So we have David here also. He's a... Uh, He's 10 years old. He taps me on my leg and he's like, I have a question. Hey. Uh, and then he also said, I'm really nervous. Is that normal? So I see. Oh, <laughs> David. Let's go, David. Wow, this is uh, kind of nerve wracking, but also uh, exciting. <laughs> wow. So um, my question is, what is your probably your favorite thing about life. David, thank you very much for your so brave. question, for your being so brave to come up. A very good question. By the way, I think it's such a good question. I'd like everybody here today to think about that question. It's a great question. Repeat, what were the exact words? What is your favorite thing about life, right? Your favorite thing about life. It's a very good question. So everybody think Wait, about that. What is your favorite thing about life? Probably my mom. Aww. Aww. You're so cute. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. His poor dad. Is he here? <laughs> is that, no, it's... So what's your favorite thing about life? That's such a big question. I would say that I get to... that I get the gift of waking up each day doing what I'd love to do with people that I really love. I think that's it. Yeah, I mean, it's similar. It's, yeah, you know, copy it's, my uh, answer, white I think, I think <laughs> we saved That's why you made off. me go first. <laughs> but <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say the thing 
my favorite thing about life is that is that through what we study, what we do, blanera, blanera, as we say, I wake up almost every single morning excited for the day. And I think, and whatever, whatever it's filled with, whatever comes into the day, but to have that blessing, to really live with excitement, excitement and inspiration almost you know, every single day from the moment we wake up. Wait, wait, so do you wake up without excitement and then shift it, or you just... Leonora, Cruise Leonora, it in. I don't, but, I, again, there's different days, of course, but but I think that the I, being honest that that you know Blanera, Blanera, most of the days to wake up with that excitement and inspiration. Let me tell you how we wake up. <laughs> I wake up about an hour and a half before I need to do anything that somebody's going to see me doing because I need a moment. <laughs> he wakes up, doesn't have anything to drink, nothing, just goes out the door, and he's like ready to go. Yeah, he's pretty okay with that. <laughs> Okay, so I need some practical help. I need some practical yeah. help here. Um, from this moment on, I do not want to turn into a fruit fly. No fruit mm. fly. No, no fruit fly. And I say that jokingly, but actually serious, because um, five months ago, my father passed. And I saw him pass. So right away, when you shared the fruit fly example, I said to myself, I don't want to have that consciousness. Um, because if I'm real with myself, there's obviously a wave of emotions that one experiences when, when their loved one dies. It's been a painful journey. Uh, but I'd like to hone in on the actual specific thing of me seeing my father pass. Um, because again, I don't want to turn into a fruit fly. Um, and the truth is, is that on one hand, intellectually, I know that um, it was a divine moment and I felt a huge energy in the room after it happened. And I feel that it was a huge blessing to be able to see that. On the other hand, though, I do go through some roller coaster of emotions of it was a sad moment to see someone I love so much. And I do have images in my mind of that, that sad moment of seeing him that way and seeing someone die. It was the first time I ever experienced it, and let alone someone who I loved more than anything. So these emotions kind of come and go, okay? And there are moments where I'm sad about actually seeing that happen. But I do know the divinity of it because, like, I happened to, we were in the house, and I was in and out of the room, and I happened to be in the room, and I saw his last two breaths, and I just had that image in my mind. But I want to like transform this into having no negative thoughts. So maybe you can help me completely eradicate those thoughts and shift my consciousness to share maybe some practical Kabbalah wisdom about how great it is to see your parent pass um, or anything else I can do to just like overcome those negative thoughts because I just don't want them to come back. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, no, beautiful. Thank you, David. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. You go first. I mean, we so, both experienced yes, this. Yes, yes. So in the it's, last in, it's interesting two, because, uh, you know, as, as everybody here knows, so the Rav left the world a number of years ago and, 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 um, and my mother a few years ago. And so my, I'll, I'll share my both images that I have in my mind. And, and also what it's taught me. So the Rav left this physical world in Los Angeles, and, and of course, we flew with the Rav to Israel, and the Rav was, uh, was resting places in Tzfat, is in northern Israel, as most of us know. And when we got to Tzfat, so the way the process is, they, they bring uh, the body into a separate room, and they prepare it. And I was there in the room, there, uh, so a few minutes before we were going to the actual funeral. And I saw the Rav lying there, and the first thought that came to mind, it says in the Zohar, when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai left this world, he turned to his side and he was smiling. And when I saw the Rav in the room in Sfat before, before the burial, I saw him smiling. So, and, and whenever whenever I'm with the Rav and my mother in Sfat, my vision of them is when they're lying there smiling. With my mother, 
Uh, we were actually in the room uh, when, when, when her soul left her body. And like you said, and I'm sure you experienced this as well, it was probably the, one of the holiest moments I've ever experienced in my life. And for me, it actually caused the opposite of, of fear. It actually made what we study cl clear in a very practical way that this is for a soul that is doing what it has done, what it's meant to do in this world, it's actually one of the most positive, most beautiful moments in life. And with that, what that takes me is that every time I watch a video of the Rav or my mother teaching, what's life, right? Why, why do we want, I mean, again, sure, there's many reasons why we want to be here, but if we really ask our soul the question, why do I want to be alive? I want to be alive so that my soul can bring goodness into the world. And I look at somebody like the Rav and my mother, and they're still bringing goodness into this world. And Bezat Hashem, till the day that pain, suffering, and death is removed, they're going to continue teaching, teaching us, teaching me. So what it did for me, the, the whole experience, besides for me it was holy and elevated and beautiful, it, it, it made it clear what is the importance of life. The importance of life is not what I think often we put to it, the importance of life is to allow my soul to express its light so that it could bring goodness into, my, into the world and into others. And therefore, every time I think about death or I think about the Rav and my mother and their process, it's just make sure, I say to myself, that you're expressing your soul to the extreme because that's, that's all that matters. And, and the Kabbalists often speak about the fact that a person's death is an indication of the life that they lived. So, so if the death is, a, is, is an elevated, pure, and a holy process, that's because their whole life led towards that. And again, this is not an easy process, but, but, but really if you internalize the process, because it's no coincidence, the Creator brought you in that room when your father was passing, but the, the purpose of it is to drive you is to drive you, and, if when you, and you will find that to the degree that you use it as a driver for the extreme expression of your soul in the world, it will turn more and more into positive. Got it. I would just add, I was there uh, when Brother Rav and Karen, and, and then my father, and they were very different experiences for me. I think with the Rav and Karen, I felt different with their passing because they're still here for me in many ways and teaching, but also the way they left the world was clear that it was part of the process, right? Like they're still doing the, the elevated work. With my father, I felt that he had fear in leaving and that he wanted to stay, even though he also wanted to go because his body wasn't supporting his soul anymore. So I think like you, for many months after his passing, there was like a residue in my heart. And it, and it visited me like very often, every week, each day, really. And now I'm, I'm in a different place, but I remember I went to California and there was a woman named the Eagle Woman, and she, I met her actually when Karen was passing. She was there for Karen's transition that last few weeks. And we connected, Abigail connected with her. She was very, um, she was very spiritual. So months after my father passed, um, I woke up in the morning, and I was in California, and I said, I don't know why, but I thought to text you, you came into my mind this morning, I wanted to reach out. She's like, it's so interesting that you are because Karen came to me last night in a dream. Do you want to come see me? And I, you know, I usually want to hear just from the creator, but I thought it was an opportunity. So I went to go see her and um, she's Native American and there's like a whole process that you, that you go through. And I had just come back actually from Mexico and I was having like serious stomach issues. So I'm laying down and she puts her hands over your body 
and she doesn't touch you, just over your body. And she puts her hands over my stomach and she starts to like feel it in her own body. She's like, what's going on with your stomach? I didn't say anything to her. And by the way, after I left the room an hour and a half later, my stomach was fine. Like, I mean, completely. I expected to feel a little bit better, but like I was completely fine. But she also said that, um, you know, I see a little girl eating popsicles. Who ate popsicles when you were younger? And I said, oh, I did. I loved them. Like those cherry, orange, grape flavor, the popsicle popsicles. And she could taste it in her mouth, like my favorite wow. flavor. And then she said, I see your father. And she saw him the way that I had started to envision him. Because when he first passed, I just saw him in his sickness. Right. I saw the disease. And, every, and that was great pain, right? Because I couldn't remember all the great things. I couldn't remember the father that raised me, but I remembered the father that was sick. But because time had passed, and again, I was challenging myself to kind of see this differently, I started to see him when he was at the height of his career. He was in his 30s, and I was probably two or three, and he was very successful, and I saw him as this powerful man. And she starts, without me saying anything, she's describing like the suit that he's wearing, wow the ring he had on his finger, this beautiful kind of the father that I, the father I knew, the soul, right? She saw the soul. And she said to me, I want you to know that he didn't take the disease with him. Because not every soul, some souls that pass, they have to come back and they're going to have the exact same tikkun, the same correction. She said he's healthy and she, he didn't take that sickness with him. And it was very freeing to kind of hear that, but also I started to see it in that way. And once I did, then I didn't think about the seven years of his cognitive decline. I didn't think about the times he couldn't remember me. I didn't think about him in hospice. I saw the soul. And that was really truly what helped me get past the pain, not just for losing him, but what I felt like he had lost in his own life. You know, so maybe you wanted your father to experience this part of your life, whatever the, the, the Whatever you're holding that is that pain, try to see the soul. And I think that's what Mikhail was saying also with Reverend Karen. And if you see that, then the other thing is just a shell. It's not, yeah. it's not your father. That last two breaths that you were there for, which he wanted you to be there for, and that's why you were there, but it's not him. Got it. Okay, thank you. We'll do uh, one more question. So my question is, and it has like two assumptions. If, if we know that death either occurs from two ways, either like the creator plucks us out if we accomplished our tikkun and fixed it and we fixed a correction, or Hazrat Shalom, the angel of death wins, but we also know like immortality and the endless is possible. What is the Kabbalistic reason for death? My hypothesis is that it's a way for the creator to like hold us accountable and as a way to give us free will to say like you're gonna have this much time but can you go into that sure thank you first of all thank you david thank you david for your question so obviously it's a very large large topic but this the simple answer is death exists because we still need it the second we won't need death anymore it will no longer exist what does that mean that means again that there's two main reasons. Like you, the, the ultimate reason is if a soul has literally, as Moses and the great Kabbalists, when they complete their journey in this world and they've revealed everything they need to reveal, then they're actually taken to a, to a more elevated place where their soul can be free. That's why, by the way, in, 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 in ancient Hebrew, the word for, there is no word, death is actually uh, um, freedom. Ptira, meaning you're free of the bond, the bonds of, of, the, of the body. So that's what the highest state, right? So that literally completed everything they needed to complete, and, and therefore the death for them is a gift so that they can actually express themselves without the confines, the, the bondage of the body. Then there's the other two categories that most people fall into. Either because a person has not been able you know, over time to get to their correction, to, to allow their soul to express itself in the way that it's supposed to. And the ego, or we can, what we call, call sort of the clipot or the negativity, has, has so blinded that person that, to that point where, where the best chance for that soul to actually 
develop and, and express itself is to come back again. And before it comes back, a lot of those shells, and that's why sometimes there's pain in the process of death or even pain of the soul afterwards, so that the soul comes back cleaner. Second category. The third category is, again, somebody who's, who's lived you know, their life that they're, that they're meant to live, and maybe, again, not push themselves uh, you know, to the degree that they should have, could have, to completely express them, so they have to come back, but it's also still a different process of death. So I would say, again, to, it's a much larger topic. There's three categories. One, where the person has perfected themselves, and then death is just a, a really a, a gift for them to be able to remove the, the bonds of the soul. Second, where the person has not expressed their soul as it's supposed to, and there's too much we would be called Kabbalistically klipot, or shells upon it, or, or blindness around the soul, where it makes sense, it's the best thing for that soul to go sometimes through a little bit of pain, and then leave this body and, and cleanse in a certain way, so they can come in for an, an, a second time to really have the opportunity to express their soul. And then there's where, where a lot of people, even spiritual people, find themselves, which is that they, they've revealed light, but there's still more for them to reveal, but, but, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, they're not really aware of how much they have to do, what they, how much they can do, and therefore they come back again just to continue the revelation because, but if, and this is, I think, the inspiring part, if we do push ourselves consistently with the Creator sees that we're pushing ourselves consistently beyond the bonds of what's, what we had thought previously is the maximum that we can do, then there's a real purpose for the soul to continue to stay here and continue to stay here. Again, ultimately, of course, we know, the purpose of humanity is to come to a state without pain, suffering, and death, but it's up to us. Death only exists because we still, unfortunately, need it. And our work, certainly in the Rosh Hashanah, but our work is to, is to transform ourselves, to transform enough people, to transform the world enough so that that reality of pain, suffering, and death can actually become eradicated from our world. But again, the sad truth is that death exists currently, only currently, because we collectively still need it. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. And uh, we hope you enjoyed listening to us and this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. And I am assuming, of course, everybody here not only listens to the podcast, but shares it with every single one of your friends and family. So thank you. Thank you. Stay spiritually hungry.